welcome to the Spring Institute 2022. And I'm um, very pleased and happy to hear the surprising impact of hands um, from our colleagues in the Faculty of Land and Food System. And without further ado, I'm going to pass the torch, the mic to Cyprian Nomas. Hi there. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. I'm um, so grateful to be presenting this. Um, this has been uh, pretty crazy, I don't know, two years, and I guess it's still going. Um, but one of the, and it feels like we're really learning from a lot of the things that we've seen. And one of them was we set the studio up in earlier this year, and it just took off. Um, before we get started, I just want to acknowledge that I'm joining you from the traditional ancestral and unceded lands of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh people. Uh, um, and my name is Cyprian Lomas, and I'm in the Faculty of Land and Food Systems. Um, our co-presenters today are Sahil Sahibo and uh, Dr. Carol McCausland, sorry, and Duncan McHugh. Um, and so. Just to start it off, we set the studio up after a couple of failed attempts um, around the beginning of 2022. So very recent history. I don't know, I think the, the pandemic was over and then it was not again. And um, sorry, and then the last point is I wanna encourage you to, it's a small room, go ahead and um, ask questions. If you want to interrupt, you can put your hand up. You can uh, show, you can use the reactions and, um, put your hand up digitally or just put it in the chat. Thank you very much. And over to you, Carol. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So I'm delighted to be here as well um, with my partner on this, uh, Sahil. And um, we'll just what I'm going to do is show some slides. And it is when um, Cyprian suggested, if you have some questions, don't hesitate to unmute yourself and just ask the question uh, verbally that might be more direct than um, putting, raising your hand because it might be slow to see it. The title of this presentation is A Surprising Impact of Hands and it's to showcase what the LFS pop-up studio is doing, um, but also to give you an idea of, so I'm an instructor um, in LFS and was teaching, was one of the people, was one of the many people who was teaching at UBC in spring of 2022 when this happened. When over the weekend, at least here in British Columbia, we went from being in person to being, everything being shut down the doors, but everything having moved inside. And so we were trying to scramble to try and present um, our lecture material, do evaluation and everything through Zoom, which most of us had no clue how to deal with it. And so what we got was a lot of, so I'm an economist, and so there's lots of graphs involved in what I do. But what you got, my students were seeing was, here's the picture. There was a little cursor moving around. If they were lucky, sometimes I could annotate. And then there was my face up in the corner, usually frozen in some weird uh, facial position. And it was just difficult in that context to explain, um, wait, it was difficult to explain graphs and equations and images because you couldn't get in there with the image. Usually when you're presenting graphs to students in economics classes, you will be in there and you'll be drawing that on a whiteboard or on a document camera, or even if it's projected over top, you will have a pointer and you can be moving your hands around showing, this is where I'm talking about the supply curve. Here's when I'm talking about the demand curve in case the student forgets which one's demand, which one's supply. And so it was just really hard to do this online. Um, and another thing was that your body language was just missing. So all they were seeing was a head. And so all of that movement that your hands do, which conveys information to people that your words don't necessarily give ever or is slow to deliver, that was just missing. And there is evidence and it um, when I made this slide, I thought this was emerging, but research has been done on this, you know, for 20 years about the role in, of gestures in teaching, um, but gestures matter. So, and particularly, this is what the recent stuff is finding, it matters, especially when it's paired with explicit declarative knowledge. So, like, when you're saying, do this, then step B, then step C, having the hands that are helping students get that, um, there's that extra information that comes around about the shape of things and the flow of things. And that was all missing when we just had our faces up in the corner of our Zoom screens. And also it just seemed weird for students to just be seeing this head. 
And so I played around with it on my own um, early in, I guess, spring 2022. And I was talking with um, Cyprian and people in the Learning Center about what can we do just beyond PowerPoint? And then they figured out um, the Learning Center ways to. Um, I'm actually having a hard time seeing what. Sorry, the... I'll just adjust the monitor slightly so that you can see it better. Um, so we played around with OBS for a bit. And so what we're showing you today is not using OBS, but that was what we had initially to work with. And OBS could do a lot, but it was very fragile. Um, and so they created a studio environment where the instructor could act like a weather forecaster. So I guess I was working with the two failed attempts of the studio. Um... Not quite, but one of the attempts was that we had, this was our, this is the final stage that, sorry, come on screen. This is the final pop-up studio version that we have set up, but you were maybe in the version right before that. Okay. Where we had it set up within a day when you needed to go online because of the speed at which UBC announced that we have to switch to online teaching. So yeah, this is one version ahead of your version. Okay. So, and it was great because you could now be in front of your slides. And so like a weather forecaster, I can be in there. I can be, here's my supply curve. Here's my demand curve. Here's the $2 tax that you might be setting in a market. And then I can show the students, see how the $2 tax drives a wedge between the prices that suppliers are getting and that's what consumers are paying. And then that leads to a lower quantity, raises the prices for one of the groups. And, um, but it did allow me to draw on the slides. And then we were able to, you know, students could keep that in the video that they received afterwards of the lecture, but also we could save the annotated slide deck and then that could be uploaded afterwards so that they actually had the slide deck that had been annotated during the lecture as well. Um, but it just made a huge difference for me, at least in terms of what I could present to the students, because I could be in there. Um, and if I needed to, I could draw on there and supplement the um, content as we were moving along. Oh, and I guess one of the things that we can now do is that we've got you know, better technology than originally with the ATEM Mini Pro. And so from a touch of a button, you can toggle between your slide deck or a video that you might want to have that you've set up in advance on YouTube or a dot cam. So you can have multiple inputs that are coming in and it's really quite seamless to move in between them. So let me just go over all the constraints that we had when Carol had approached us. One of the constraints for us was that space for us was a premium at UBC. And so in the previous iteration that we had, uh, Duncan might be able to talk more about that. We had to give up that space and move and set the studio up in our temporary space, which is technically a flex space over here. So if I can just show it around for you, I am going to go ahead and show you what the studio looks like. So there's our green screen, <laughs> lights. And over here, we have our two screens set up with a monitor right there. And you can see yourselves over there. We have our back channel running and our graphic tablet set up on the table with the ATM Mini Pro, which works as a switcher. So now I'll be switching from the mobile view back to the slides and I'll be able to talk to you again and you'll be able to see me. <laughs> Duncan might be able to talk a little bit more about uh, the previous iteration that we have for the studio. Yeah, so uh, I think one person or one thing to <clears throat> just impart if you're um, thinking of setting up something like this is just to know that this was done over several years. So we started uh, experimenting with studio space many years ago, but um, like many people at UBC, we've struggled with finding um, dedicated space for that. So um, it's kind of been bumped around the building a bit. Uh, and then we finally decided to take over uh, a computer lab that we had set up within our office. So the lab that they're in used to be called the media lab. And uh, we remo removed some computer workstations to make that space. And so uh, it's still a flex space. So um, when Carol was showing off the green screen, um, <clears throat> you may have seen that it was on a track system. So we actually have four different backgrounds. Um, so we have a black, white, 
gray, <laughs> and then also uh, the green screen. Um, we can also move that away. And if we want to have this as a meeting space or a video conferencing space, we can we can set that up as well. So, you know, in our faculty, we have this um, ma mantra mostly about research spaces that nothing, no one thing does one thing. Is that right, Cyprian? <laughs> I think I'm butchering that a little bit. <laughs> um, but we found that we've been able to take that to heart with this space as well, because we can't really have just a studio space. We also have to keep it um, accessible as, as meeting space. Um, so the equipment has iterated as well. Um, we've had DSLRs for this purpose when we've um, recorded uh, videos. And um, now we've upgraded to the Blackmagic uh, Pocket Cinema camera, which um, is really the most affordable at the leap if you're going to make the leap into cinema cameras like that that quality um the black magic is the 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 most painless way of getting there because um the prices for those can go through the roof but this was relatively affordable and it's comparable to a, a dslr and um as uh, sahil mentioned when he originally um took on Carol's request. He was using OBS, but it was the ATEM Mini Pro switcher that really made this seamless and uh, has been the thing that, that is kind of the secret sauce, I'd say, for the studio. So I can add more about why OBS is not was not as good as the ATEM Mini Pro. So in the beginning, um, we hadn't set up the ATEM Mini Pro and um, we had OBS running the green screen cancellation and had different layers. So a little bit about OBS. OBS is a broadcasting software. And the thing that it does is that it allows you to bring in different kinds of windows, different kinds of files, and allows you to customize your video stream. So now, for example, if you are on Zoom, you have one camera, and that's usually your webcam, just giving you one single stream. But what if, you wanted to have your slides or your window that you're sharing behind you. OBS as a production software allowed you to bring in all of those different layers. And you might have seen this in a lot of different videos on YouTube. If you have seen any videos on Twitch, a lot of gamer uh, vloggers use these. But um, what we wanted to do was we wanted to experiment with this in a teaching setting. And when Carol approached us saying that she wanted to have hand gestures for slides, OPS was a no brainer for us uh, in the beginning. But then we started realizing that the green screen cancellation that's on OPS, it's, it's uh, done via a software rather than a hardware. And so you start seeing all of these little glitches on the green screen cancellation, which is not the best. When we switched from OBS to ATM Mini Pro, there were a few benefits of it. One was that it reduced our uh, tech setup time. It was a lot more stable. The green screen cancellation now happens on hardware. So if I can just show you what our original video stream looks like, that's basically what the original video stream is. But with just a click of two buttons, I can bring back uh, the slides and everything else, which is a lot easier than on OBS where you'll have to go open the window, switch between the layers and do all of that switching. So having this hardware did uh, make things a lot easier for us. Yeah, so OBS was hard to work with if you wanted to switch your input. So you wanted to bring in a video for three minutes and then move back to your slides. Whereas now it's like single touch of a button. The upside of OBS though, is that it was free. And so in theory, if the instructor knew what they were doing, they could run all of this in their basement. And so all you would need would be the green screen hanging over, you know, tacked up to your window and having two cameras and then the OBS. Um, but they were able to develop something much nicer than that, than my dark basement, in which the lighting was changing as the sun was setting. So not great in the winter. Um, it also handles green screen. Um, you can see how wrinkled the green screen is, which um, just shows how robust the chroma or the like the 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 ability to knock out that green is. Because um, that with uh, less robust so software, that would cause some issues. But um, the A10 Mini Pro does an amazing job of it, and we don't have to laboriously steam clean it every time we want to unroll it and, and use it. Um, I guess what I'll talk next about is just from an instructor's 
perspective, having the ability to be in the screen was just, it was lovely because it made me feel like I was in a classroom and I can have on my screen, I can see my students, those who turn on their cameras, I could see how they're reacting. So again, like being in a classroom, uh, you could have these multiple modes. So you could be running eye clicker polls or have the students typing in word clouds through Mentimeter or using the chat and annotate functions in Zoom. Um, one of the things that I noticed when we moved online was that the students who were making comments was different than the students who were commenting in class. I've heard this from other faculty members at other universities as well. It's like, it's, and it's sometimes like a completely non-overlapping set in which the kids who feel comfortable typing into the chat are not necessarily the ones who will pipe up in class vocally. But this was a nice thing that, that we discovered that there was another set of students who wanted to talk or contribute. And another thing that's been really great and want to keep is that the students are having a video afterwards. And so they were using this as reference material. Um, and it was, and it's easy to exclude the student images from the recording if you just simply spotlight yourself, then Zoom was automatically leaving out the students. So the recording didn't have the students' faces. And the default was that the students weren't seeing each other. And so they could go through and change their settings afterwards so that they could see one another. But the default was that they weren't. And so they didn't feel as on, I guess, on display. And the students really seemed to like this. When we were stuck online, they liked the weather forecaster. Um, these are some of the comments that we got from the student experience of teaching. Um, and you know, things like they, well, they liked that we were making an effort for one, but they also seemed to like having this technology. You know, it felt less sterile, et cetera. Um, the cons were back when it was OBS, OBS was just notoriously unstable. And you, you know, 16th lecture into the, sem into the semester, it would just do something new and weird. And so we needed to have a better technology, which we now have, or Sahil had to be within earshot. So I could yell out, we've lost, you know, we've lost the camera. Um, the other one, and this is everybody I think had this problem and there are various solutions, how to get some of the students to turn their cameras on so you, the instructor, are not just talking to little boxes. Um, one of the things I did was lotteries. If it's every time you had your camera on, your name went on a slip, all the names went into the slip halfway through the semester and then we did a draw and whoever won got candy. Um, but there's also been a debate about maybe we should just stop fighting that and just accept that maybe students actually learn just as well, maybe even better, if they can be doing else, something else simultaneously in their homes um, and don't want to have the camera on. Um, again, the ATEM Mini Pro, that seems to have fixed a lot of the problems that OBS was causing. But we still need to have redundancy in a back channel because sometimes Zoom fails nothing to do with OBS sometimes. And I had this, this semester student was giving, participating in a date debate from outside the country. And this was a big part of their assessment and Zoom just shut down across the whole university. Um, and it's good if there's a way that the students can check in through something else saying what just happened so that they don't freak out, we can get them back. Um, and so I guess that's one of the cons leading into Continuing on with this, like the, the students really like the videos and we shouldn't be requiring that students are coming to school when they're sick. They shouldn't be coming to school when they're sick. And so if we wanna incentivize participation, we need to be careful that we're not also incentivizing presenteeism, which is bad for public health. And so having multi-access seems like it should be an important part of our delivery at UBC of content and engagement with our students. And so I guess what I, you know, if I get to put in a request for what, what are we going to do next, it would be figuring out how to take all this fabulousness that we have for an online course to turn that into a multi-access course so that I can do push a button and we've changed what the students are seeing, both the ones who are coming in through Zoom and the ones who are in the classroom. Um, and so that's, I guess, moving forward and a discussion point about how do we pair multi-input presentations with multi-access instructions, instruction. I think um, it would be great if uh, anyone who is attending the, the, uh, the workshop here or the, the presentation uh, wants to weigh in with some questions.
or oh. so feel free to put something in the chat or you're welcome to um, unmute and turn on your camera if you prefer and and ask. I still have a bag of candy upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, I, I, oh, what's the estimated budget for all of this? <laughs> that's, uh, that's the tough question. Um, how, do you want to take it, Duncan? Sure. Yeah. Um, so, like I said, we we iterated this over many years. So, and and we've used this equipment for many purposes. It doesn't just serve for a studio space. It also can um, be used for you know recording uh, workshops or or going out um, and and recording videos for other purposes. Um, I would say if you wanted to recreate this exactly, it's probably around 7,000 uh, or a bit more, um, but you don't have to do that. Um, you could bring it together with the equipment that you have. The ATEM Mini Pro, which is the, the thing that we've talked about is around $800. So that is, you know, that's a, a, a an investment, um, but it can handle any kind of HDMI input. Um, so if you have a, a DSLR already, um, you can, uh, and it has a, an HDMI output, you could use that. Um, the, the things, I mean, that I think the trickiest thing at UBC Vancouver will be to find a space that you can put it in. Um, but once you've got that, then a green screen is, you know, you can build the frame yourself uh, with kits. It would be around a hundred dollars. The lights are a couple of hundred dollars. Um, if you have a PC, a decent PC, you can use that to run some of these systems. None of those things I think should be a, a barrier. Um, the camera that we use right now is around $2,000. So that again is um, yeah, like, you know, it, it's an expense. Um, but if you have other cameras, then you you could make use of those. Yeah, you don't have to do exactly what we've done to have a lot of these benefits that that Carol and Sahil have spoken about. See, I wanted to, uh, initially, um, we got this working with a Panasonic GH5. And in our faculty, we lend these things out, right? So we have three or four GH5s. And we just during the pandemic, we weren't lending them out. And so um, we just took one and it served in the studio. Um, the other thing is we're in the Macmillan building on the UBC campus. So if you are interested, we are happy to show you anything. Um, just let us know and uh, we can set something up. We were going to mention is that um, some of the people who have expressed an interest in using this is also the students. So they're excited about the idea of being able to be in their presentation Depending on your configuration, you can have videos in the background and so they can be engaging while they give their presentation with something they might have done out in the field. Um, and so it's a nice, um, it's a nice studio for using for also building um, content. So I know other faculty are for students who missed such and such a lecture this year, they're saying, well, you can look at last year's video that I made when this thing was online. And so one of the things I'm planning on doing over time is building up tutorials for some of the content that you know is repeated every year. Here's how you do this type of assignment so that they can watch the videos. Um, and so I plan to use the, the studio for recording those. Um, I wanted to talk about potential other usage. Um, the, so I think we mentioned that this was a, a later iteration of the studio um, and the other iterations, basically we had very few uses. Um, to the point of, um, well, it, it was frustrating. Um, and um, however, I also wanted to note that UBC, UBC in general has about 10 studios that I know of centrally, plus the big one. And then a couple other faculties have studios as well. And, and from what I hear uh, with possibly with the exception of solder was that most of those studios were not used very much, especially at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and so for us, the big break came when, um, well, started when Sahil started, started working with Carol and then Carol presented at a faculty meeting. And then after that, we had perhaps 10% of the room contacted us saying, hey, can I get my hands on this? We would, we'd like to use it. Um, and so potential other uses are obviously the um, communications and marketing people are interested as are the um, development people. So people who want to create media to um, interact with alums. The other potential use is we had a studio, a student show up one day 
the second, the day after we opened it and said, hey, I hear you have a studio. I'm going to a conference and there's going to be a three minute thesis competition. Can I use it? And so uh, we, we said yes. And this guy was a natural, um, quickly recorded his video in an afternoon and we hear he got second place, right? But this guy had a ton of charisma, it's, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see him on TV or YouTube at some point in the future. However, um, perhaps 50% of the inquiries coming for the studio now are from students, right? And I think Sahil could elaborate, but I th uh, some of these are grad students, right? And, and I think that the ability to stand in front of a camera, first of all, it's, Carol, I think you're probably a natural as well, right? But it's something that a lot of people feel uncomfortable the first five, 10 times they do it. Um, but you get better at it, right? And I and I think for students, sometimes students need to stand in front of a camera for a high stakes event, like a job interview, or a interview for like a recorded interview, or a conference. And it's my hope that um, by making this available to students, they will, this will become a, a, a skill that they develop and bring with them in their career, almost like a literacy. Um, and so to that end, we are also talking to our student services to possibly conduct workshops in here. Duncan, it looks like you want to say something. Uh, I was just going to mention, uh, we've also launched uh, a couple of micro certificate programs or micro credential programs. And um, the ability to have something with a bit more polish than someone doing a Zoom video at home is really nice for that as well. Um, because those are all being delivered remotely. This is, um, Sahil has assisted the professor or the instructors for those courses. So um, they're able to present you know, uh, recorded lectures with a bit more polish, uh, which is, is nice. As for going forward in the future, Carol, okay. You, thank you for your request. I mean, a couple of the things that um, we're thinking of is um, group student presentations. I know we have uh, an instructor who's, who has constantly been hounding us for a way to get his students in front of a camera to do a group presentation. Um, potential use in three minute theses. I know Duncan helped uh, one, of our, um, one of our winners do a th three minute thesis video. Um, I'm pretty intrigued by the whole one button studio idea. And the idea behind a one button studio is you, you go into a room and you press a button and do your thing, walk out with your presentation on a, on a, uh, on a flash drive. Um, because right now, as an administrator, the, we still need to have somebody supporting the professor. Um, yeah, there you go. Thank you, Duncan. Um, and then, I mean, one other feature, I'm, Sahil, you mentioned Twitch and YouTube, and I don't really watch Twitch. Um, but one thing I have seen that feels kind of interesting is um, when you, and this, this actually was on a Facebook Live, when you have people commenting in the chat, um, having the person on the screen sort of pull that chat onto the screen and go, hey, Duncan from Vancouver, how are you doing? And that, that is an interesting piece interaction that I actually haven't seen in Zoom either, right? But, but I have seen it elsewhere. And, and that seems like it might. Go ahead, Duncan. Oh, I'm just going to say John has his hand up. So let's um, get John in. And then I have a question from Mo in the chat. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for sharing this uh, um, really interesting uh, uh, setup. And um, yeah, I was just sharing something with a colleague uh, that I've been involved in uh, green screen productions before through uh, this unit called UBC Health. And um, I was just wondering how portable uh, all this equipment is um, in terms of like potentially moving it from one space to another space um, and, and other, you know, colleagues using it, other instructors using it. Because I've had this issue before. This is years and years ago when we had green screen displays and lighting and a teleprompter bracket. But this seems to be a little bit more complete as a package. So I was just wondering how portable it it is for how how are you finding it in terms of portability? So I can take that question. Currently, the way we have set this entire studio up is that anything that is a device, any hardware device is on one single table on wheels. So if needed, we can just move this entire table anywhere in the room. The, we are not currently supporting moving this outside the space that we have over here, but we can 
move this entire setup to another room if needed, because everything is technically just on one table on wheels. And the only two cables that are connected to this table are a power cable and the LAN cable for internet. All the lights, they are on tripods, they can be moved. Um, and we do move them after every, every time the studio is used because this space technically is also a meeting space. So if we have a meeting here, we do not want all of this equipment to be in the middle of it. So very portable in the end. The only thing that we currently have that is not super portable is the green screen. And that is just because we have them on curtain rods. But if you have a green screen, which green screen frame, which can be put up and pulled down, which is uh, the iteration that Carol was using, you can move the green screen to another space as well. So if you are thinking about portability of this entire equipment, you can set this entire equipment up on a single table such that that table can be moved anywhere that you want. So then that becomes super portable. I wanted to add um, one of the things that is unportable is the computer that it's attached to, right? Like it's a huge box. And so if you used a Mac mini, for example, or something with that sort of footprint, um, it would be more portable as well. Um, but the, it strikes me that the green screen is always a little bit tricky, right? Because it because they are unforgiving. And so the ATEM mini does, as Sahil mentioned, does a hard work, hardware green screening. Um, and it's and it's really sharp. Okay, go ahead, Duncan. Oh yeah, I was gonna say, um, I mean, I all of the, the pieces could be moved, but it would be a pain. <laughs> so uh, it just depends on what the request is and um, it, it could be done, but uh, yeah, it, it, this isn't meant to be moved around too much right now because of the way that we've set it up. But, you know, if the right person asked, <laughs> we could do it. <laughs> so, but do you think, so I'm just thinking what we used initially, which was much, um, we were using OBS, so we didn't have a switcher. We had some little speakers, we had a camera and a ring light and a green screen and then a laptop. And you needed an external monitor if you were doing the weather forecaster thing so you could see both your students and what was happening. Like you needed a bigger screen than a, than a laptop. But how, how bad would it be if we had just that? Because all that stuff, you know, you could put in your little your kid's red wagon and yeah. take it around campus. So See, that's the thing again, that you need a second monitor yeah. to see what you are pointing at. So currently we do have a tiny monitor over here, but it's very difficult to read what's on it. Yeah. So you have another monitor over there, which is showing you your presenter notes, which yeah. has all the slides. If you are doing a weather forecast setup, if you want it to be seamless, like how it would be in a classroom, you need that feedback right in front of you. Yeah. So if you want that extra monitor, and you want to have um, a strong computer, which is not a laptop, right. then it just starts every, every iteration upgrade that you're doing for any feature, it is going to add a little more mass and weight on the mm. equipment side of things, which okay. is going to make it less portable. Okay. But in terms of uh, portability, can it be done? Yes. But there might be a chance that some of your devices might not be able to handle the high resolutions sometimes. Mm, okay. So you'll have to reduce your camera resolutions. You'll probably not get 4K out of this. Okay. Yeah. Somebody had a yeah. question. Oh, oh let me just get to Mo's first because he, he had okay. it queued up first. So he asked a question, can alumni like myself use your facilities to change the world through providing education to people in low and middle income countries. All right. So, uh, it I mean, we're uh, LFS, so we support um, people uh, people in the LFS community. Um, you could certainly reach out. And if it seems like it's a good fit for our mandate, like we'd be happy to help you. Um, but you should also know there are other facilities on campus that, that can help out. So UBC Studios has um, a DIY do-it-yourself studio. So you could look to that. I've dropped some links in here. Um, there's also the learning, um, the, the learning commons at UBC, uh, at the, the Chapman Learning Commons, uh, which is run by the UBC library. They have a DIY media studio. Um, and then there's also the Inspiration Lab at VPL, which is the central branch of the Vancouver Public Library. So it wouldn't quite be this way, although I know with the VPL, they, they do have a green screen. Um, so you could look out to, 
to those um, to those resources as well. And if you are at UBC Vancouver and want to tour and talk about potential collaborations, by all means, um, follow up after the presentation and we can talk about it. I think you had us at Change the World. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, we, we're, we're very much uh, on board with that. Um, Sharice had the next question, or anything else to add to that, Mo? So you ask, so the follow-up question is, can we use this technology to have a small class to have a small class for effective and efficient teaching and learning outcomes. Yes, <laughs> that's what Carol did uh, spectacularly last term. So uh, certainly I think this, this can really support that. Uh, let's jump back to Sharice's question. So from what I think I heard, when instructors at LFS are recording lectures or teaching a live class online, it is supported with a staff member during the entire time. This is the re the arrangement we had with UBC Studios that has a producer with the cost to rent. Thank you. So I'll just um, clarify one thing about UBC Studios. They have a couple of different facilities. So there's the Lightboard Lab or the Lightboard Studio, which does have a staff member. And then there's the DIY Studio, which used to be um, the OBS or the One Button Studio. That The One Button Studio, DIY Studio is meant to be run by the user and does not have a, a staff member present, although there's someone on call. And then the Lightboard does have someone on uh, someone there at all times. Um, Sahil, maybe you can talk about the, the journey you went on uh, in terms of the amount of support that you had to give for, for this setup. All right. So we first tried it with OBS. And since OBS was fairly new to us and we were just experimenting with, uh, the, with the software, it took us some time to get the nitty gritties of that software right. So initially the software crashed quite a bit. Um, we couldn't figure out why it was not taking a screen properly. So you had to put a lot of crop filters, but then if you change one slide to the other, sometimes changing the file changed all of those things. Back then you needed a technician, almost an earshot like Carol mentioned earlier. But then when we moved away from this, um, moved away from OBS. Even when we were using OBS after everything was perfectly set up for Carol, I did not really have to provide a lot of technical assistance because Carol, one, was experienced in using OBS by then, and two, the software was more or less working the way we intended it to work. Then we would only face problems if we were changing media types. For example, if we are moving from PowerPoint to a PDF document or a Word document or a browser. So that would um, cause issues sometimes. So that is when you needed a technician. But when we moved to the ATM Mini Pro, ideally just having one hour of conversation about this, if you are, um, if you understand this production tool, fine, you will be able to, after one hour, use this tool independently and you wouldn't even need a technician present here. So I would say, yeah, with ATM Mini Pro, the technical help that you need is very little. Uh, with OBS, you kind of need a technician. Can I just throw this to Cyprian? What, what's your dream for the future of, of this uh, kind of setup? Um, my, <laughs> so my dream would be Every instructor gets a ATEM Mini Pro to use in their basement or to carry with them when they go into a lecture hall. Um, because it's HDMI out, I think you could input that into the classroom. And you and it's really easy. You have four buttons to control four video inputs, right? And so Sahil showed um, a bunch of things, but he didn't show an iPad, right? Which is the other really obvious one for me. Um, the um, And there's um, the other thing about this piece, this piece of hardware is that it also, if it mattered to you, you could output to YouTube um, or to a hard drive. Um, so it, it's really pretty fe well featured. And and, um, and the fact that Carol picked it up in, I don't know, an hour, did you say? Um, just, just makes me feel, I mean, obviously Carol is the perfect client uh, <laughs> who, um, who, you know, says, hey, what does this button do? And then she figures it out. Um, but, um, that, that strikes me as simple enough to use, right? Like, because I know that when you're struggling to in front of an audience um, and something goes wrong and rattles you, 
it, it very quickly could become a downhill spiral, right? And I, um, something like this ATEM Mini Pro with four big buttons, I think, um, and and there's a fade to black and and over off on the right, um, just seems like it's easy enough. It seems to hit that sweet spot of um, scaling up end users to do amazing things, right? I, I mean, a lot of we we support people in the learning center as well, and we're constantly trying to. It's a fine balance between how much do we do the work or how much do we make it easier so that we're not needed. <laughs> anyway, that's that's what I would have to say. So can I just add a few things over here about the ATM switcher, the way we have set it up currently? Uh, you mentioned we did not talk about an iPad, but I have been using my iPhone this entire time to show people what's happening uh, in the studio. So our fourth input is currently set to a portable device, which it's currently my iPhone, but it can be for any device that can handle HDMI. So it can be an Android phone, it can be an iPad, it can be a tablet, it can be a second computer. So if you want to bring in your laptop on a station that's already there, you can do that as well. Uh, currently we don't have anything on three, but two is our slides. One is the green screen camera. And then we have a software control panel, uh, which is, just download it on your laptop or computer. And over there, you can select which input you uh, are setting as, which input has the green screen and needs to be filtered out. And then you can just set it up on the key over there. So if I press off on the key, we disappear. If I press on, we <laughs> reappear. And currently I have put an image in the background and the image is our Faculty of Land and Food Systems logo. But you can also do the same thing as fade to black. And I'll bring everyone back again. So Hill, can you do the little square in the corner? And and while you're doing that, like yeah. but yeah, and you're right. Sorry. I I realized as soon as you said that that really the iPhone is where I live. And so to be able to use that in my my lectures or whatever, I don't lecture, but to be able to use that is is closer to real life, right? So videos that you shot that day, videos from out in the field, student videos, right? If they airdropped your videos, you could presumably show them right away. Anyway, thanks. I should clarify, I don't think I, anyone here is getting any money from ATIM Mini. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just want to be clear that we're not uh, <laughs> secret agents. <laughs> We are just big fans. Yeah, just fans. Yeah. Actually, for five simple payments of uh, one ninety nine, if you call now, I can help you. Do we have a voucher code for them? <laughs> but yes, it is the thing that I love about it is that everything that all the softwares are providing us with, right? In Zoom, you have immersive video now, you have picture in picture, you have those virtual backgrounds, you have backgrounds where you are a tiny head on the bottom, uh, but you're still cut out if you go beyond your uh, particular box range over there. You have all of these features, but this one tool does everything for you. And it's easy because you can see what buttons you're pressing, which is why we kind of like it. I, I, it strikes me that um, one other thing that perhaps worth mentioning, so Dunk, uh, so he'll mention Twitch, right? And so it feels like we're constantly being driven by whatever our students are seeing, right? And so if they're using Twitch to communicate and we're using uh, something not as good as Twitch, it shows, right? Um, I mean, obviously stability matters. We got, so I, I got the inspiration for the ATEM Mini by hanging out with digital video people, right? And at the beginning of the pandemic, I didn't go out. And so I spent five hours every weekend talking to the digital video pro people, right? And um, this, this for them was, um, you know, perfect opportunity. Well, they were rethinking their, their whole business, I think. And so I think it's important to just be open to cast a wide net for where you get your inspiration from. And that, that's the key thing, right? $800, I think, initially, seems like a lot, but if I'm saving whatever sales salary is, uh, that pays for itself very quickly. And the reason I got into interested in the idea of the weather forecaster was I was watching um, amateur musicians online and when they got pushed online, they started trying out with OBS and it, I came into the learning center. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it turned out that Wayne had also been experimenting with it. And so 
you know, it was, and one of the other things that we haven't used, but there's like software like Jamulus, which allows like almost instantaneous, like the delay is so small that you don't actually hear it anymore. So you can actually jam with people in real time um, for music. And the lag, you know, is just a killer for playing music with other people online, but they figured that out. But we just, we didn't need that for teaching. But, you know, I guess, so that's that thing about, hanging out with people from other silos. And sometimes they're doing something you're thinking, oh, you know, that could really help me. So ukuleles, gaming. <laughs> um, I don't see any more questions. Thanks for the um, great comments from people. Um, and I know at least one person asked for a tour so in direct messages. So I will, uh, I will um, pass that on to the team. Um, anything else? We have uh, 10 minutes till two o'clock. So anything else to add? Well, I'm I'm good with all the things that I wanted to talk about today. <laughs> Unless people want to see what the software control for ATM Mini Pro and OBS looks like. Um, I had not planned to go that technical in the presentation, but if somebody is interested, I can go ahead and show that as well. Um, I wanted to add um, just two things, just to sort of see what, what, what other experiences in the room. So we have the... Um, the UBC, we support the UBC farm and we also have a, a distant location in Agassiz Dairy Research. And so we're very interested in portability and outdoors as well. So John or others, if, if you have ideas, let us know. Um, and I mean, the, the tough thing for us is we spoke about a $2,000 camera. Um, I have a, like a $2,000 iPhone that takes the most amazing pictures ever, right? And, I, and I'm not the only one on campus with that thing. So we're also very interested in where iPhones go in this as well. Um, go ahead, take it away. Uh, Samina asked for a tour of the, the hardware. So how? All right. Okay, so you have seen what the hardware device looks like, but that hardware device has a software control device, which I'm going to share right now. I am now behind the ATM software control. I am going to put up the monitor again because I need to see what I'm pointing at. So on the ATM monitor control, we currently, this software production uh, software is used for all kinds of production tools that Blackmagic provides, which is why you see a lot of these gray boxes here because those are for production softwares which have production tools, which have like 16 different inputs that they're handling. ATM Mini Pro handles four, so you have four buttons right there. Currently, we are on the second one, which is why that one is lit. And this is for previewing. So we also have a monitor connected here on HDMI, which tells you what the, uh, which can show you what the preview would look like. So you have that software control. On the other end over here, if you can see it, um, it shows what your, you can add different kinds of palettes. And one of the things that you can do is you can control the chroma key on the palette. So I'm here I'm going to point at the chroma key. So the chroma key is our uh, green screen cancellation. You can see it's coming from camera one, which is why when I am moving from camera one to camera two, when I switch on the key, Oh yeah, you should also be able to see that every time I am changing anything over here, if I, it is also showing up on the software control. So you do not actually need to control this hardware tool from the hardware tool. You can actually have it connected via a LAN connection to another computer and that computer can connect, uh, control this device instead of having someone who is teaching control it as well. So you, this it, it's very versatile. You can do it in multiple ways, but that chroma key is the reason why you are able to see the screen behind me and me in front of the screen. So that is one key thing. It also provides you, because we are using Blackmagic devices, it allows you different kinds of control. Like you can see over here, you have camera control directly from the device and from the software. So you can actually control different things with the camera. So you can control the camera's focus. You can control a lot of different things. You can control your audio inputs. Everything can be done via the software, but 
this is only for setup. Once you have set this up, this device is ready for you. And then you only have to provide the hardware. The other thing that we had used in the past was OPS. So I'm going to um, go ahead and find the mouse and <laughs> open OBS Studio for you. So this over here is your OBS window. And as you can see, you have the option to create different scenes here. So each of these scenes is basically a collection of different layers. So the more layers you have, the more inputs you're bringing in. So currently uh, over here, again, OBS is an open source tool. So you have a lot of different plugins that are provided by other creators who, which will work with OBS and allow you to add more flexibility to it. One of them is, for example, an NDI, um, NDI plugin, which comes from New Tech, I believe. And that allows you to connect your phone as an external device if you're connected on the same LAN network. So yeah, having the same LAN network really allows you to do a lot of beautiful things with all of these softwares. But over here, you can add a media source, you can add an image, you can add a display capture, which would be uh, from your, which would be just mirroring your screen. And you can add video capture device, which would be your camera. And you can add different kinds of windows, which would be under Windows capture. And I have also installed the plugin for iOS device capture, which allows you to bring in your iPhone or iPad. So once you have these scenes set up, you can set scenes up for different kinds of things. You can set one up for slides. You can set one up for um, videos. You can set one up for documents, a web browser. And that is what we had done with Carol. We had basically set uh, all these different scenes up for each and every type of file that she was going to use so that all she had to do was switch between those scenes and they can be renamed. And once that is done, all you have to do is export it as a virtual camera. And that would allow you to bring it in to Zoom as a camera device, as a webcam. So that is just a quick run through of all the technical devices that we have used in the past <laughs> and are currently using. Thank Do you, you have any specific questions that you want to ask about this? Yeah, I'm going to actually, I'm going to close the session. Um, you can continue the uh, discussion afterwards, but I just wanted to thank everybody for coming uh, today. Uh, thank you for the discussion. And um, I especially wanted to thank Sahil for all of your tireless work. Uh, I mean, Sahil, I think was working on this morning as, as well as uh, all the other work and thank you so much Carol for um, being the perfect <laughs> the perfect um, inspiration <laughs> yeah and thank you very much Duncan as well and then the, our other colleagues who aren't in the room well they are actually is Judy Chan thank you and Gabriel Smith thank you and and our IT department